I love the Thanksgiving holiday. I love the Thanksgiving history. And I agree with O. Henry that Thanksgiving is ours. It is the only truly indigenous American holiday. I got excited last week when I saw a house with a true Thanksgiving decoration on the front porch. It was a pilgrim. And that was the first pilgrim that I had seen. On closer look though, the next time that I drove by that house, I saw <laughs> it was a skeleton dressed up with a pilgrim outfit. And I thought, way to repurpose your Halloween decorations for Thanksgiving. I began last Sunday a sermon on the topic of taking things for granted. I define taking for granted not seeing the value or appreciating something. The understanding that I have of the phrase is similar to that of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. The dictionary defines the meaning of taking for granted as, number one, to assume something as true or to be expected. An example is to assume you are invited to a party as if it is a given. Number two, to value something or someone too lightly or to fail to properly notice or appreciate someone or something. Last Sunday we saw don't take God for granted, don't take your friends for granted, don't take your health for granted. Let's continue that study this morning with number four. We must not take our families for granted. Children often take their parents for granted. They assume that their parents owe them what they want and do not fully appreciate what their parents do for them. Children ought to be thankful for the sacrifices that their parents make for them. And children who have wise parents ought to be thankful for them and never take them for granted. In Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Parents sometimes take children for granted. It might seem to parents that when their children are small that they'll always be at home. And that may cause some parents to take for granted the precious time that they have with their children. It is said of Boswell, the famous biographer Samuel Johnson, that he often referred to a special day in his childhood when his father took him fishing. And that day was fixed in his adult mind. And he often reflected upon many of the things that his father taught him during that day and in the course of their fishing experience together. And after hearing about that particular trip so often, it occurred to someone much later to check the journal that Boswell's father kept and determine what he had said about the fishing trip that day from a parental perspective. In turning to that date in the journal, the reader found that only one sentence was entered. The sentence was, gone fishing today with my son. A day wasted. It's a foolish mistake for parents to get so preoccupied that they don't have time to be with their children. I think about Jochebed. Jochebed was a mother who taught while she had the time. When Moses was come to years, he, cho he chose not to uh, be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose God because 
of the teaching that he had received from his mother. Parents don't take your children for granted. Husbands often take their wives for granted. Suppose you ask a man, a president of a company, who under God is the most important person in your life? He thinks about it for a moment. He says, I guess that would be my vice president for marketing. And uh, you say, what about your wife? He says, oh, of course, I just assumed that. I just took that for granted. It goes, it goes without saying. Well, a few people would assume that his abounding love and respect for his wife caused him to forget her. Most of us would probably assume that the reason she didn't come to mind is because she wasn't first in his mind. She was not uppermost in, uh, in his affections. The wife wouldn't say, well, I'm so honored that I'm like the air he breathes. He never gives me a thought. There is in most people's minds no direct correlation between taking something for granted and showing its value as a treasure. We can be certain that the wife would say, well, if I don't come to your mind when you're asked about your life's priorities, then it's because I'm not important to you like I should be. And if you think I'm being honored by being taken for granted, you're wrong. They have feelings and they need to feel appreciated. They need to feel the compassion of a caring and considered husband. The wise husband will communicate with his wife and will determine her needs and then show his appreciation to her through meeting those needs. In 1 Peter 3 and verse 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. On the other hand, Many husbands are also taken for granted too. And their needs are often not met because their wives do not appreciate them fully. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. I heard of a man who was not loving his wife as he should. And he wanted to do something better. He wanted to be better so that his wife would appreciate him more. He was advised to think of all the ways that he could to, to make life happier for his wife and then to do those things, to, to put those things in motion. And so a few days later, the husband said, he said, every day I, I leave for work and I put in a hard day and I come home dirty and sweaty and I stumble in the back door and I go to the refrigerator and I get something to drink and then I go into the rec room and I watch television until supper time. He said, after talking to you, I decided I would do better than that in the future. So he said, yesterday, as he's talking to his counselor, he said, Yesterday, before I left work, I showered, and uh, before I went home, I showered, I shaved, I put on a clean shirt, and on the way home, I stopped at the florist, and I bought a bouquet of roses. And he said, instead of going to the, to the back door of the house, as I usually do, this day, I went to the front door. And I rang the doorbell. And my wife came to the door and she took one look at me and she started to cry. And when I asked her what was wrong, she said, it's been a horrible day. First, Billy broke his leg. That was her son. Billy broke his leg and had to have it put in a cast. She said, I no longer return home from the hospital that your mother called and told me she is coming to stay for three 
weeks. She wasn't too happy about that. Then she said, I tried to do the wash and the washing machine broke. And there is water all over the basement. And then she said, and now you have come home drunk. <laughs> she just couldn't believe it. We must not take our families for granted. In the next place, we must not take each day for granted. You woke up today. I woke up a little later than usual because my alarm clock didn't work. When you woke up this morning, the first thought that came to your mind was probably, what day is it? And the next one was, what's my to-do list for today? But if you stopped and thought about how fortunate you are to be able to wake up today, every day is a blessing. Don't take tomorrow for granted because we may not have tomorrow. Solomon said in Proverbs 27, 1, boast not thyself of tomorrow for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And I've seen that happen in so many lives and so many families. Turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses seven through nine. Ecclesiastes 11, 7. Truly the light is sweet and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. And let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. And walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. These verses urge us to enjoy life. When you look out in the morning and you see the sun peeking through the window. When you get up, when you see the sunrise. Thank God for another day. Psalm 113, verse 3. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Praise God for the day. Find the beauty in each passing day. Sigmund Freud suffered from a horrible cancer in his mouth. In 1926, he also developed heart trouble, and he spent time in a sanitarium and he returned to Vienna, Austria, with a yearning for morning drives. And for the first time, he experienced the glories of springtime in Vienna. He wrote, what a pity that one has to grow old and ill before making this discovery. Man must remember that his physical life is brief. He is called a vapor. James 4, 14, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even as a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. Life is likened to a flower. Psalm 90 and verse 6, In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. Psalm 90 and verse 10, the days of our years are threescore years and ten, if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Enjoy the sunrise. Jesus said in John 9, 4, I must work the works of him that has sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays, a great Christian educator and president of Morehouse College, wrote a classic poem entitled, Life is Just a Minute. Life is just a minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon you, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to you to use it, 
you must suffer if you lose it. Give an account if you abuse it. Just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. We ought to begin each day with a prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this day, for a good night's rest, and for the privilege of being alive one more day on this earth to serve you. One of the most poignant stories I ever read came from the Los Angeles Times. A woman named Ann Wells wrote it. She said, my brother-in-law opened the bottom drawer of my sister's bureau and lifted out a tissue wrap package. He discarded the tissue and handed me the slip. It was exquisite, silk, handmade, and trimmed with a cobweb of lace. The price tag with an astronomical figure on it was still attached. Jan bought this the first time we went to New York, at least eight or nine years ago. She never wore it. She was saving it for a special occasion. Well, I guess this is the occasion. He took the slip from me and put it on the bed with the other clothes we were taking to the mortician. His hands lingered on the soft material for a moment. Then he slammed the drawer shut and turned to me and said, Don't ever save anything for a special occasion. Every day you are alive is a special occasion. Isn't that a touching story? Every day is a special day to the Christian. Every opportunity to serve our Lord is important. We remember Paul's admonition in Colossians 4 and verse 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Next, we must not take the privilege of prayer for granted. You know, if there is one area of the Christian life upon which all of God's people could use some improvement, isn't it that of petitioning God in prayer? Why doesn't my child talk to me more often? Is without a doubt a continual question in the mind of God. Jesus taught his disciples both by precept and example to pray. In Luke 11 verse 1 it came to pass while he was praying in a certain place when he ceased one of his disciples said unto him, Lord teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Prayer is a cry unto God. Exodus 22, 23, if thou afflict them in any way, in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. Prayer is described as a beseeching, 2 Corinthians 21, uh, 2 Kings 21 through 3, as a calling on God, Acts 7, 59, a lifting up of the heart, Lamentations 3, 4, a lifting up of the soul, Psalm 25, 1, and a pouring out of the heart, Psalm 62 and verse 8. We say that prayer is offering up of our desires to God, for things agreeable to his will, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus conceived of prayer as a means of direct communication with God, as the establishment of a vital contact between himself and the one in whom all men live and whom and have their being. Turn to Hebrews 10 for a moment. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 19. And let us see that the privilege of prayer was made possible by the work of Christ. Hebrews 10, 19, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience 
and our bodies washed with pure water. We have direct access to God by the blood of Christ. And as a result, we have boldness to enter into the holiest by that very blood. One of the descriptive terms for our Lord here in this passage is high priest. And the Latin term for priest there is pontifex. And that means bridge builder. There's been a gap. There's been a chasm between us and God due to our sin. But Jesus as our high priest is our bridge builder. He's bridged the gap between God and men. And by him, we can approach God as he's our mediator. He's our go-between. First Timothy 2 and verse 5. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And so because of his work as our redeemer and as our mediator, we can come to the throne of God in boldness, Hebrews 4, 16. And that word boldly is translated confidence in Hebrews 3, 6. And it literally means freedom of speech. Openness. We've got open access to God. We can approach him with confidence. Not because we are deserving, no. But because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for us. Prayer is commanded of God. It's not an optional thing. It's not a take it or leave it matter. We're told men ought always to pray, Luke 18, 1. Continue in prayer, Colossians 4, 2. Pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. In James 5, 16 says, The effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now let me ask you this question. What if the government decided to take away the privilege of prayer from us? That's exactly what happened to the prophet Daniel. The government made a decree that anyone who asked a petition of God for 30 days would be cast into the den of lions. That's Daniel 6 and 7. And then reading from Daniel 6 and verse 10, you see his reaction. In Daniel 6, 10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. It was his practice to pray three times a day. He knew its importance. Even when it became illegal, he continued to pray knowing that he could receive the death penalty for it. Knowing that he could be thrown in the den of lions for it. And he was. But like Daniel, we should never take prayer for granted. And then finally, we should not take heaven for granted. We're not going to reach heaven on the faith of our parents or the faith of our grandparents. J.D. Stripe wrote, Faith is like a toothbrush. Every man should have one and use it regularly, but he shouldn't try to use someone else's. I cannot believe for somebody else. They cannot believe for me. Faith is not inherited. Faith is based on conviction. That is why it is incumbent upon us to seek to instill faith in the hearts of family and friends by means of teaching. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1, 5, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwell first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. He was taught the truth from his childhood. And Paul would say to him in 2 Timothy 3, 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast heard of and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. He received the truth properly. He was to continue. He was to build on the foundation that had been laid in his childhood. 
It's very important that parents recognize the obligation to impart the truth and live it before their children. And it's important for children to recognize their obligation to receive it, to be assured of it, to know it, to obey it, and to live it out as they grow. But here's another thing. We won't reach heaven on the sincerity of our actions either. Paul said in Acts 26 and 9, I barely thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to that of the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm reminded of George Washington and how his life was ended prematurely by sincere doctors who thought that bloodletting was the way to go. They thought that bloodletting was helpful rather than harmful. And they sincerely thought that they were right, but they were just as wrong as they could be. And then we won't reach heaven on the practice of the majority. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then we won't reach heaven based on our perceived goodness. Cornelius was of good report among all the Jews, Acts 10, 22. And yet Cornelius needed to hear the gospel as a penitent believer and be baptized into Christ. We must not take heaven for granted and think it's going to be ours without the grace of God and the blood of Jesus. We're saved by grace through faith. He Ephesians 2 and verse 8. And if Hebrews 5 and verse 9 says... Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Friends, let's endeavor not to take things for granted. Don't take God for granted. Don't take your friends for granted. Don't take your health for granted. Don't take your family for granted. Don't take each day for granted. Don't take the privilege of prayer for granted. And don't take heaven for granted. For granted. Someone has said, when you take for granted what you take for granted, someone else is praying for. Happiness never comes to those who don't appreciate what they already have. Don't wait until what you have becomes what you had. And that is so true. When it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or you take them with gratitude. Be grateful for God. Be grateful for his blessings in your life. Be grateful for the salvation that he offers you. And come and obey your Lord today as together we stand and sing.